We were kind of joking that we were just going to get up here and just... Look shoot the shit. <laughs> Instead, we'll shoot the shit. <laughs> Justin, when was your uh, last panel? My last panel ended uh, 30 seconds ago. Okay, and how do you feel about that? Um, I was like scared, I was nervous that I was going to delay everything for this very important discussion. And I also was kind of abruptly ending the last panel, so it was an awkward ending and now beginning. But I think I'll live through it. Well, it's very easy for you. You're just a moderator and you have one question to ask and then you're done. So I got a question for you. How done, stellar. <laughs> um, it actually is <laughs> a question. I mean, I guess uh, I'll set this up like we, we, we've been talking a lot over the past few months about um, changes that are coming to Stellar. Obviously, we announced the, the launch of Sorabon yesterday in the, uh, the FutureNet, and we've been working on Sorabon for a while. This is a massive change, um, and it introduces sort of a whole new world for developers, a ton of surface area for innovation. Um, it is not something that was on the roadmap five years ago, right? And so obviously as the world changes, as the ecosystem evolves, as new needs arise, and as there's like new opportunities for innovation, it means, hey, we gotta keep thinking about what, what, should, what should happen in Stellar. We need to talk to the ecosystem, talk to the community. And so I think the goal here is to start to talk about those things. What are the things that are still open questions um, that we want to start to think about what's sort of how can we build a, road, a technical roadmap to start to solve them and I think the first area that I want to talk about is around smart contracts so extensibility right so Sorbonne creates extensibility why, why is it important um, where how much work is left to do to add extensibility to Stellar um, yeah so you should read a blog post that I uh, wrote earlier this year uh, titled Why Now? A Smart Contracts on Stellar and uh, J Project Jump Cannon. And uh, I think this represents a bit of a paradigm shift uh, for us. And that is, uh, you know, we were really focused on cross-border payments in the early days, really focused on asset issuances and, and all the basic primitives you need for a batteries included cross-border payments experience. Um, and, you know, what we've seen is a lot of great innovation, like trust minimized innovation, right? You know, we started, Stellar had one of the first DEXs out there, uh, but what we saw is like more, uh, more liquidity or more facilities of liquidity emerge. And, um, you know, one option we had was to just like keep integrating these into the base protocol. And we actually did that with AMMs last year. Um, but in this process of integrating AMMs, we learn so much about um, you know everything that's out there, and we realize that you know like that you're asking we're asking how done is Stellar, but the cryptocurrency ecosystem is just getting started, so not done at all. So um, you know, and we want to make sure that we have a space for people to build these type of tools on Stellar. Now, if you throttle innovation by uh, the rate at which you know, core developers can introduce features of Stellar Core, well, that's a bit slow. Um, and you know, it's not very future-proof. So we want to really build more extensibility so that other people can innovate on Stellar. And this is what Sorbonne is. Yeah, I just have to add. Yeah, not only is it slow, but like you, you cut off a lot of potential things that you just won't think of, right? Like you, you need this like, um, open-ended thing that's infinite, essentially, that people can experiment on and, and uh, develop things that you, you will never think of, right? So. Yeah, and, and it's also like, you know, it's like the, the Linux philosophy, right? You want to have people that specialize in one thing, right? So core can specialize in being like a really great base layer, having like a really great peer-to-peer -peer network, really great consensus protocol. But it doesn't mean that they need to deal with the actual financial instruments that are getting built on the network. Do you think that new, you know, we, we introduced, in the past, we've introduced new features with protocol upgrades, right? So, I don't know, uh, claimable balances or clawbacks or AMMs. Um, do you think new features now will be added outside of the protocol by people developing on Sorbon, or do you think that we'll continue to add new features to the protocol itself? Yeah, I mean, it, it'll be from both directions, clearly. Like, I mean, there's, there's still gonna be stuff that we're gonna have to add to the protocol. Um, you know, stuff like specific for Sorbonne, like for the smart contract platform, that we'll have to improve that over time, and it's definitely not going to be done anytime soon. Um, 
you know, going back to this question of when we're done, I mean, software is never done. There's always like stuff that you can add and change to it. And so that'll be true of the, the core protocol as well as like the external surface. Yeah, I, I completely agree. Um, I think we're going to see uh, basically this bifur bifur bifurcation, is that the word? Of uh, innovation where you have um, like financial instruments being innovated on as contracts um, on Soroban. But then a lot of building blocks are still going to be built on the Soroban side. And one of the things that we're doing with, uh, with Soroban is we're really focusing on having a batteries included user experience or developer experience so that all the basic stuff you need as a developer is already there. You don't need to reinvent the wheel all the time. So, you know, in, in the world of uh, other networks, what we see is, you know, we see things like ERC-20 contracts, which are, uh, it's nonsense, right? You just like copy paste, uh, you know, hundreds of times the same contract. We're seeing people that are like constantly deploying libraries that are doing serialization and deserialization. We're seeing libraries that, that implement crypto on like the byte level and it's, it's just completely inefficient and, and, and it's a lot of surface area for developers. It's a lot of waste. It's unoptimized. It's a lot of room for error. Uh, so, you know, our philosophy and, and by the way, our philosophy has always been batteries included. I think we've just changed the definition of you know, what are, what's a set of batteries? That did, did we always know to say it was batteries included or is this a new, I feel like I'm hearing this phrase a lot more. I like it. It's I always said. Tomer's phrase. Yeah, it's Tomer's phrase. It, it, yeah, it's a Tomerism. Um, but to be honest, I've always, uh, I think uh, since, you know, since I joined Stellar in 2017, people always ask what's the difference with uh, Ethereum. It's always been about, uh, you know, all the, all the stuff that you need to deploy smart contracts for in, in other networks. With Stellar, you could just, um, you know, you had, multi-sig and you have assets and you have decks and you have all these other things that if other networks you, you, you need to program yourself, here you have it as a first class primitive. And, and that's what we're doing at Sorbonne. We're just introducing a different set of first class primitives. Yeah, I think in, in general, I feel like Stellar's always been more opinionated than a lot of other networks and kind of it's still the same sort of philosophy is that you know, we're trying to do one thing well rather than like everything under the sun. Yeah, and I think uh, there was actually a really interesting, um, uh, I noticed uh, one of the uh, developers in the Near ecosystem who's been looking at Soroban uh, published this thing on, uh, on GitHub uh, the other day in which they uh, compared yesterday. I, I think we learned about it yesterday. It oh. might have been on GitHub for like a week or so. Um, but uh, basically they compared the, the, the size of uh, the Hello World contract in Soroban compared to the Hello World contract in Nier. Um, and uh, I think unoptimized, it was around 3% uh, of the size. And optimized, it was like less than 1%. So you basically more than 100x improvement in uh, size. And what, what is, what, like, that's, first of all, that's awesome. But like, why, why did that happen? What, what, what did Sorabon do? Like the, how does Sorabon work differently that, that uh, causes that size difference? Um, it's a bunch of things. Uh, we, re we really have uh, extreme talent, uh, Rust talent in, in, in Stellar. So uh, we built a very careful implementation for these contracts in which you really don't need that much logic on the contract side itself because a lot of the logic um, is achieved through communicating with host functions which run um, which are super efficient they run on the actual compiled uh, environment so you know in stellar core uh, for example uh, we also we don't use the standard library the standard library is a, is a bit of a huge monster um, and uh, through like you know a meticulous set of uh, like careful um, implementation we managed to get there, and uh, um, I, I hope we could even do better. I don't remember the original question. How did I get there? I, I basically said, how, why, why is it so much smaller? How did that work? Oh, yeah. But I mean, I, I think, so extensibility, right? That's sort of the first thing that we were talking about. And I think on the, I see that this is actually supposed to focus or at least mention a technical roadmap. So it seems like on a technical roadmap, there's a lot of Soroban related stuff that is sort of where extensibility is gonna come from. Scalability. Where, how does, like, what, how much work do we have left to do to allow the network to scale and what is it? Yeah, I mean, there's obviously, um, I, I feel like Stellar's like fairly scalable in terms of like 
compared to other blockchains out there in the world, but there's obviously a lot more to do there. Um, and particularly once uh, we have smart contracts on it, that will like affect the scalability story a lot. So um, there, uh, we don't have an answer quite yet, but there's like a lot of things that internally that we've been like discussing and, and thinking about and like which direction to take this. I mean, one of the, one of our goals for when we're building sort of in the first place is to make sure that we built it in such a way that it wouldn't preclude scalability in the future, right? So we're doing a lot of things there to, to, to make that story a little bit easier when we, when we get down the road. But. Yeah, for sure. I think there's a lot of room to grow uh, in, in the base layer before we actually start talking about various L2 solutions, like, um, you know, like dedicated payment channels for smart contracts and, and things like, uh, uh, like rollups. Uh, Sorbonne is built to facilitate these type of things, and we've actually been talking with various uh, ZK experts on uh, what types of primitives we can add in the Sorbonne base layer as a host function to make sure that we're uh, that we're kind of like building for the future. Um, and by that you mean to allow L2s if and when they're necessary? Right, yeah. Uh, so rollups and specifically ZK rollups, zero knowledge rollups are kind of like uh, one of like the biggest or the most promising uh, scalability solutions uh, in, in what we're seeing in other ecosystems. So we definitely want to enable these. Uh, but you know, first there's a lot of room to grow in L1. And I think that a lot of you know, networks like Ethereum that doesn't have a lot of room to grow in L1, it's very important to have these things right now. Uh, you know, we're not quite there yet. And, and I think that we have a lot of headroom. Um, one of the things that we've been building into Soroban is an ability to execute um, transactions in parallel. Now, this is not something that we plan to launch with. We have the building blocks, and they will be there at launch. But then we can, without actually changing the protocol for developers, we can introduce improvements to uh, like how Stellar Core executes Sorbon transactions in a way that takes advantage of uh, multi-core and uh, concurrency. And yeah. Yeah, interesting. And I guess is that when you say there's, we have a lot of headroom, we have room to grow, like sort of the fundamental at the layer one level, is that where it's coming from, from concurrency, from parallelism? Or are there other technical changes that can be made at the core level that would also allow for scalability? Yeah, I, I mean, I think we, like, it, as in like we have a lot of headroom right now, like the network is not saturated right now, so like it can handle like many more transactions than it's currently doing. Uh, but then, yeah, like short of protocol changes, there's a lot of stuff we can do to actually just make the, the current core just more efficient. Like we're making changes to the bucket list. I think we're, we're talked about before that, that'll make things way better. Uh, and some other kind of like internal optimization changes that will give us a lot more room before we actually have to make protocol changes that will make things uh, scale further. But so that's of course on the roadmap as well. Um, so yeah, there's just a lot of pieces. It might be worth talking a bit about what the, what that headroom concept is. So uh, today in the Stellar protocol, you actually have a configuration variable that's set by validators uh, to um, uh, it's called max tx. I don't the, the name of the max variable. tx sets max transaction set size. Max transaction set size, um, and basically the validators can choose what's the maximum number of transactions they'll process in a ledger. It's currently set to 1,000 uh, ops per ledger, which means that if a ledger closes around every five seconds, then uh, you can fit around 200 transactions per second on the network today. Now, this is an artificial limit. We can actually bump that up. Um, and uh, you know we've seen in various test situations that we can definitely take that number up. But the higher that number goes, the less inclusive the network becomes. So the, you know, you'll, you'll need better network equipment, you'll need uh, better computers, and we wanna make sure that Stellar is still um, you know, diverse and inclusive and you can run it on, and, and by the way, like you can run Stellar Core on a Raspberry Pi uh, with you know, not that much network. So um, we wanna make sure that's, that Stellar is still available for everyone. And it, it, do we have a sense of what the technical limit is to how much we could like sort of increase, the, how much headroom there is technically at the moment? So I think, um, uh, so Stellar, there was a great talk the other day by Hidenori from uh, the core team who was talking about um, uh, Supercluster, Stellar Supercluster, which is a, form a framework we use to simulate um, uh, like a full decentralized network and to make sure that we don't introduce progressions when we're making changes and to make sure that 
um, you know, when we think something is improved performance, it does improve performance. It's very hard to say that these numbers actually reflect exactly what happens in the real world. But I think that the trends are really interesting. And, um, you know, Jed was talking about the bucket list DB stuff, which has been amazing, uh, like advancement in, in the actual database that Stellar Core uses. Um, and, you know, we're seeing like 70% increases uh, from that. Uh, we're seeing uh, pull mode, which drastically reduces the communication overhead, which is what uh, Hida was talking about the other day. Uh, which uh, um, is, is also uh, showing like significant uh, like TPS increases. So I, I think like if you ask for a specific number, I think that the number right now in these tests set around like 600 um, and going up. But um, we also know that these simulations, because they sh uh, a lot of these uh, virtual machines share resources, they actually perform not as good as the real network. So um, it's a bit hard to say. Uh, I, I don't think, to be honest, you know, in the, in the uh, crypto space, people love to like throw TPS numbers out there. A lot of them are like complete nonsense and, and absurd. Um, and it, there's a, a great website called realtps.net. It shows you how much uh, networks are actually processing. And if you'll go there, you'll see that, you know, you'll have networks that are uh, advertising. Oh, we can do tens of thousands of transactions per second. They're actually handling like 0 0.7. 0 0.7, yeah. yeah. Less than one <laughs> transaction per second. <laughs> yeah. Way so, to go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, and, and Stellar actually handles 150 transactions per second on like an average basis uh, all the time, which is, uh, I think, number yeah, two. And it's a usage metric, metric, too. That means like people are actually pushing that many transactions. People are actually using it and it's handling it. And I, and I would say that to date, you know, so when the, when the number of operations per ledger exceeds the, the threshold, that thousand, um, the, the network goes into surge pricing mode to basically allow people to bid for ledger space. Sometimes this impacts developers, especially if they don't know that how fees work on Stellar. But generally, even then, the fees stay pretty low, even when it's in surge pricing mode. But I would also say that I've never heard discussion among validators saying, hey, we need to increase the limit. And generally, I haven't heard it from people building on the network either. So that theoretical headroom, is, it's great that it's there. It's not like we're, we're dying to use it right now. It's actually, as Tomer pointed out, like it is nice to keep the, the, the actual uh, throughput at a level where you can run Stellar Core on a pretty small computer, um, which is interesting. But I, I guess it, that, that is, you know, are there other scalability solutions that we should talk about, or should we move on to talking about uh, other things on the roadmap, other concepts? Yeah, I mean, I think all the all the other scalable stuff is, are probably too far off to like discuss now. Like, there's. Uh... Yeah, I think uh, if if anyone's been paying attention, we were looking at something called SpeedX uh, last year, which is still um, um, kind of like on the back burner right now, but might uh, uh, once we uh, deliver Soroban, it might be something that we're going to revisit. Uh, which is this really uh, um, amazing research from one of David's students in, in Stanford, which shows how you can actually create like an extremely highly concurrent decentralized exchange that's also more uh, fair and is not susceptible to uh, to um, uh, front running. Front. Uh, and uh, really uh, amazing research, and, and we were looking into implementing that. Uh, it's a bit orthogonal to the idea of smart contracts because it does centralized liquidity to some extent. Uh, so it's still something that we're looking into. It is extremely efficient. So basically you have like, um, you know, instead of, uh, instead of running a bunch of, uh, you know, trade operations uh, in series, you can actually do like a very fast computation that um, allows like this virtual market maker to determine a price and then you can have everyone execute, everyone execute at the same time, which is, uh, super cool. It's still like more in the research phase, I'd say. Oh, yeah, one other thing I would mention is that I, I think it's uh, like most of the transactions on Stellar now are, are, are trade transactions. They're not like payments, right? And so there's some potential that uh, once Stellar is out there and running that like a lot of these get moved off the core protocol in the same way like Ethereum, like most of them don't happen in the core Ethereum layer. So uh, we probably before we need to do much more scalability uh, work, we want to see how that plays out to see how that affects the Right, so work on the extensibility part to allow people to build things outside of the core layer to see what happens. I mean, and also, so not all transactions are sort of equal in terms of their impact on scalability, right? Orders on the order books, trades versus payments, which one is, 
which one takes more resources? I mean, trades do. Yeah, payments are fairly simple, right? Just moving balance from one account to another. But um, yeah, so, that, so that's another reason. Like, I think we even have a different fee structure for, for the, not trades, but like stuff on Storebot, which could potentially be more trades than, yeah. Right. Yeah, and I think it, this is something that is worth discussing in the context of like how to, uh, you know, crank up on scalability. Um, you know, right now, most transactions on Stellar deal with the order book. Uh, the order books are um, you know, extremely efficient as far as order books go, but order books in general are not the most efficient data structure um, that, that you can have. And there's actually like very clear physical limits and mathematical limits for, for how fast they can go. So uh, we're, um, I don't know if this is the right time to say this, but I do think that eventually we might kill the DEX. I, I don't think we're gonna kill the DEX, but we'll see. <laughs> Should we, get, should we do a vote here and decide based on the outcome? Who thinks we should kill the decks in favor of performance? Afraid to <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, wait, I gotta, I gotta write down the names. Who's voting what? Who we should not? Favor of. Yeah, see, look, people love the decks too. That's, it's, <laughs> it's, Tomer, actually this, this, an open discussion, right? And it is, and this is great because, like, Tomer's opinion, I think, monolithic, for an organization, different, different points of view, right? And I think it's cool that Tomer can say, um, "Let's kill the deck," and say, "Let's not kill the decks," and actually, right? So I think it's. I'm glad you. But I have a microphone now, so. Um, but seriously, I actually think having public discussions about controversial issues like where scalability versus the DEX, which one to favor, is like is the right move now, right? It's the right move in general. And I think like one thing that I want to know after this session is like what we can do as an organization or through channels or as an ecosystem to just like talk more about this stuff together because I don't know we, we are kind of making it all out. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> yeah, I think I think I think Jed and these people are driven by nostalgia. They they they, they just like the decks because it's been there from day one. It's you know it's it's a cozy feeling of, of familiarity. Um, but you know it's yeah. it's order maybe, books. They need to die. Maybe we won't have this debate now, but but <laughs> we, we know that the debate exists. We can return. The, the to debate it. does exist, and yeah. uh, I think that's the important point is that the debate exists. Exactly. But, uh, you know, it's important for. Not just people that you have to talk about, it, but people widely to like weigh in on this and like help us like make these decisions because like ultimately like you're the people using the, the, the network group here. So um, scalability. Anything else to say about that? Because the third topic is governance, which we kind of just segue to. How do we make important decisions? You know, um, is is there a technical component to decision making? Some of it's obviously off chain and social. Are there technical changes that need to happen to improve stellar governance? If so, what are they? Do we even know? When do we deal with them? Um, so, like, an interesting thing about Stellar is that it actually has like governance baked right into the protocol, right? And and it's one of the first networks that were like very uh, that had a clear governance structure. You have configuration variables. Validators can 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 vote on them. There's a protocol upgrade, you know, validators need to vote on it, which is really interesting because in a lot of like other networks, you don't really have a proper governance structure. Uh, you know, it's, so like that TPS configuration that you mentioned, that's exactly, yeah. Yeah, that is governance per se, right? Um, and SCP is actually a really great governance model because it's governance uh, that's based on trust, right? It's on reputation. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm trusting, I'm explicitly trusting another validator through SCP because I know their reputation. Um, you know, this is very different from a world in which you have like stake-based stake governance, which, which is what we see a lot in the in other ecosystems where people just like, uh, you know, kind of like uh, surrender their voting rights to whoever like has the most uh, like money. Right? Yeah, I mean, it's like like the, all the protocol changes are baked in where the, the validators vote, and they can like uh, like approve certain upgrades and not others and things like that. So like that 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 mechanism is pretty well done, I think. Um, 
I think Stellar has like the same governance issues that like all open source projects do, where it's it's sort of an open question of how you manage those, and they're they're done in lots of different ways. Um, you know, from either having like a benevolent dictator that just kind of decides everything to like more like consensus driven, but it's always this kind of like give and take be between like because it is a very technical thing that we're building, uh, and so like you do have to have like the necessary expertise, and there's like with software there's always like a million trade offs like we just talked about with the decks, where you know it's like you're you're trading. You know, one thing versus another, like you know, like scalability versus like utility, things like that, right? And so the, these trade-offs always exist, and there's never really a right answer. Um, so it's sort of this uh, tricky thing. So we have kind of like a combination of the problems of the normal open source governance coupled with this this thing that's like widely used as like an economic uh, you know tool that that has like lots of stakeholders that are trying to use it in all different ways. And so it's like it complicates it. So it's like a, it's a pretty thorny problem actually. But um, yeah. No, no exact answers, but I know it's something that, that we need to like um, continue to improve and definitely as the network grows, like it, it'll become more of an issue, so. Can you picture like an ideal governance wise, what an ideal outcome would be or an ideal future? Do we, not, do we not even know what that might look like at this point? I mean, you have certain like, it, uh, you know, I think humans in general don't know, really know how to like have ideal governance structures. Like, I mean, like, you know, what country is like ideally governed? And so, you know, I think it's like this. You know, it's like a, it's a process. It's not like the, like there's an end goal state. I mean, ideally, everyone would have like a voice. You would pick the, you, you'd have the wisdom to pick like the best things, and like this. But I mean, all of this is kind of just like platitudes. There's, I don't know the exact method other than just like trying to do our best. Improve like, humanity. So, improve, yeah. Improve rationality, yeah. Uh, well, I, I do think there's an I ideal governance uh, mechanism, which is um, uh, if, if there are zero governance decisions to make, then it's a perfect system, right? So, and, and I think we actually do need to think about like minimizing the number of decisions that need to be made. And if you look at Soroban, at the end of the day, it actually takes like, like a lot of the decision making around financial instruments away from the protocol layer. And that's super important. Yeah, yeah, that, that's actually one of the big arguments for it is that because before, prior to Sorbonne, we were having to make all kinds of things like, do we add AMMs, like what structure do they have, all this kind of stuff, and it was all like, essentially governance decisions that we were having to make, and like, yeah, like you said, that this kind of like removes a lot of that and like just pushes it, we're like here, here, are the, here are the primitives, you can like create these things however you want them. Right. Yeah, and I think like the, the type of discussions that we're gonna have in the future are really focused on like the technical building blocks, so it's gonna be like, Oh, there's like this new um, like elliptic uh, curve uh, that we you know, want to introduce to the like the, the store of post functions. So no, <laughs> Just, so they're not super controversial, right? Like they're they're helpful and non. They're not they're not contentious, right? Yeah, I I definitely think there there's, there are still going to be some contentious uh, things, specifically probably around fees. Uh, like I suspect that post launching Soroban probably most of the work that we're going to do uh, that's like exposed to developers is going to be around like the fee structure because fees are actually like really hard to get right. That's interesting. So what do you mean? Um, I mean that like we are putting, I was talking a bit about this yesterday, we're putting this uh, a lot of effort into this uh, kind of like a tunable fee uh, or like metering model in Soroban that actually um, basically it tries to correlate between the amount of compute, like the amount of things like CPU instructions, and uh, how, you know, what's like the value or like how much gas you're gonna pay uh, for that transaction. It is extremely ridiculous in, in other networks. You have like, you know, two contracts that take the exact, uh, same exact amount of gas can like, or can operate like orders of magnitude apart, like many orders of magnitude apart in terms of like how uh, fast or slow they go. So we do have this tunable model but we will need to continue tuning. And, and it, uh, like at a high level, what does it do? It splits out different kinds of transactions or transaction requirements. It creates fee, different fee markets for them. We don't know yet. No, so like the, the, the way that uh, metering works is basically, um, you know, you have, uh, you're executing a smart contract. There's a certain amount of like WASM instruction, WebAssembly instructions that get called. Uh, and there's a certain amount of compute that gets uh, allocated to various host functions, things like, um, you know, like verifying a signature on, on uh, a bridging transaction. Um, and all of these things 
need to add up to a number or a set of numbers that represent how costly it's been to run this transaction. And you need these things to be consistent because if they're not consistent, then you know it's not fair, right? If I'm paying the same amount for a transaction as Jed, but Jed's transaction is like offensively slow, he should be paying more. Jed, seriously, pay more. Um, so, um, and, and, and you, you do see a lot of situations in these other smart contract platforms that things are not really fair. Uh, and it's not only about fairness, it's about, it's about throughput because you want to, to design a certain amount of like space in your block for compute. And for that, you need to have like a good understanding of how much uh, resources like a, a given set of transactions is gonna take. So th like that stuff is really important. Has anybody else dealt with this or thought about this problem? Are there other solutions? Um, so I think um, you know Ethereum is is probably the primary example. Uh, they've suffered a lot throughout the years from like this um, um, kind of like lack of correlation, and and they've worked on it. And they have like this very static model in which every opcode in the EVM has like a, a certain amount of gas or or like a function that correlates between uh, you know how much uh, information it's getting to what. Uh, how much uh, gas it's gonna pay, but these things are extremely inaccurate. And, and prob a part of that is because the EVM opcodes themselves don't really translate that well to, um, to like uh, you know, x86 codes, or like ARM codes. Like, it, it, there's just like um, uh, a, a huge delta there. Um, other ecosystems have just like, you know, some people have just like ignored fees and, and uh, you know, we've, we've seen networks like crash because of that, so. Um, it's it's hard to get right. Some people like avoid it. Uh, we, we, we don't avoid the hard stuff. Are there other hard things that we're not avoiding that we should talk about, or should I open it up to questions? There's one thing. Uh, should we talk a bit about uh, like ledger bloat? Sure, go for it. Awesome. So um, I think like one of the biggest things that we're seeing in the in the in the cryptocurrency ecosystem is this uh, one where state uh, keeps growing, you know, like a cancer. It's just like, there, there's, there's, there's no stopping. And um, it, when you have like a, you know, a horizontally scalable uh, web app, that's okay. You know, you can also throw more computers. But uh, because most blockchains work on this concept where a validator needs to have immediate access to all the information in the state, that means that you actually need commodity hardware to be able to fit. Uh, the entire uh, state into a hard drive, and you also need to have um, uh, you, know, uh, you need to have a limited amount, a, a little, a, li um, a limited amount of writes and reads in order to actually uh, do that. And, and what we've, we're seeing with Patricia uh, Merkle, Merkle tries in, in Ethereum and other ecosystems is that they're run, they're starting to run into the hardware limits of of hard disks and, and hard disk controllers. So. That's something that everyone everyone agrees it's a problem. No one is doing anything about it right now. Um, and like the lead developer for Geth, which is like the oh you you were talking about that in your yeah, yeah. In your blog he gave, post. He gave a, it was actually really interesting. People should, I can't remember what it was called, but it's, it's something about like physics and the limits of scalability. Um, that is really about the the hardware limitations that make state growth beyond a certain size basically untenable. Right. At which point, what happens? What happens? No, no one's quite. Sure, I mean it. And uh, Ethereum, and, and I think a lot of the Ethereum forks are obviously much closer to, to hitting the, the hardware, the limits of hardware limitations. Um, so they will probably get there before Stellar does. I think we, you know, but it's interesting that despite that fact, like part of the conversations around Sorbonne have been pretty open about, hey, what are we gonna do about state size? Should we have state expiration? Should uh, ledger entries get, get archived, should they go away, should they, you know, how would it work, what would it mean? These are pretty big uh, and difficult conversations to have and I do think a lot of people have just, a lot of other blockchains have mostly just ignored them. Um, so it's pretty interesting that we're not ignoring them. Yeah, yeah. Um, and like, you know, we're already orders of magnitude more efficient uh, than these other systems and uh, what uh, Garen showed the other day with his uh, bucket list DB talk is that um, you know, like uh, whenever uh, ev every ledger closed, like Stellar Core writes exactly one disk operation, 
where in other networks it's just uh, it's, it's uncapped. Like you can have many, many, many uh, rights every time. So uh, we're already doing better, um, but uh, this is definitely a problem that we want to, to solve. There's like a few, uh, a few proposals on the table from uh, state expiration, which is just, uh, you know, which is gonna delete old stuff uh, to some combination of like state expiration and archiving where um, you, like you delete stuff from the ledger, but you leave a little tombstone with a hash and then like sometime later, an archiver node can come and like rehydrate that. Uh, and it's gonna be like a very costly operation, but it means that uh, not all validators need to know, um, you know, every piece of ledger entry that has ever existed. I like the idea of a tombstone with a hash. <laughs> There's tombstones in there now. <laughs> not for this, but for the bits. Um, we don't have much time. I feel like we should open it up to questions. We got some questions. It's whoever grabs the mic first. Hi, this is Fernando from Wallet Guru. Uh, could you guys talk a little bit about Starlight, sort of what the roadmap is and the specific use cases you th thought of when you developed the prototype? Uh, yeah, so Starlight is an initiative we started, uh, I think, a couple years ago now, maybe longer than that, three years ago? 2017, maybe? 2017, <laughs> okay, yeah. That's 27 yeah, yeah. years ago. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, yeah, um, and the idea is it's essentially like the Lightning Network um, on, on Stellar. Um, I, you know, I think, still think it's like a really great idea. It was kind of put on hold because we ran into a lot of issues where it became very complicated to implement on the current, given the current state of Stellar Core. Um, uh, and I think Sorbonne will make it like much easier and much more straightforward to do something like that. And so, it, yeah, so it is worth mentioning that uh, last year we, we put out uh, Cap19 Cap 40. Cap 21, 21 and Cap 40. Cap 40. My head is full of caps. Um, Cap 21 and Cap 40, which uh, actually made uh, building uh, payment channels on Stellar a lot easier. And we uh, released the second version of, style, of Starlight. So the first version came out in 2018, and it was worked on with Dan Robinson, Jeremy Rubin, and some other great folks. Um, and, and that was uh, a bit of a, uh, it, it, it took a lot of finagling to, to get that right. Um, so last year we put out another version of that, uh, Starlight 2.0, which works on Cap21 and Cap40, so the protocol is actually much cleaner. Um, we gave, uh, uh, Lee gave the, from uh, the product team, the product eng team, gave a great eng talk last year, uh, demonstrating how you can reach like insane throughput. Um, and the, the place we left it at is, you know, uh, Starlight is a reference implementation for people to build their own payment channel implementations. So right now, we're not actually doing anything in the space, but uh, the Starlight reference implementation works, the protocol is there, and we're uh, you know, really excited to see people play around with it because you know, Soroban is going to open a lot of uh, new opportunities, but if what you're looking for is a high volume of payments, then you know, Cap21 and Cap40 are really perfect for that. And do you think where Starlight is, like the reference implementation is at a place where it's Anyone, someone, anyone can pick it up and say, all right, now I'm going to build a production implementation of payment channels. Yes. Um, I guess uh, kind of jumping off the discussion of state, uh, if slash when we need rollups, how are you guys thinking about data availability optimizations, given that that has been the biggest bottleneck for ETH rollups? How are you thinking about them? <laughs> it's not my job. <laughs> can, you, um, can you elaborate a bit? Yeah, so like, I mean, part of the ETH 2.0 ro uh, roadmap for um, enabling rollups to work better, uh, just because the biggest cost for rollups is actually getting state from the chain, right? Uh, is they're adding like uh, sh sharding that is solely focused on providing state to the rollup uh, rather than doing any like execution. And then you have stuff like Celestia, which is just a data availability layer. It's just providing state to rollups and uh, optimizing to make that super cheap. Um, so I'm wondering if there's anything you guys have thought about in like uh, or like advancements in order to optimize for cheap data availability for rollups if we need them. 
Yeah, we're closely following all these uh, advancements. I think that um, you know any um, a lot of the ideas of uh, separating compute from storage um, and a lot of the sharding ideas are still pretty early on. One of the one of the best things about Stellar is that is how simple it is, um, and we really like it like that. So um, you know we're going to pay close attention. I don't think that we're going to hit. Um, you know, any scalability li limits in the near future that require actually going that direction. Uh, but we are working with various companies that are looking to build rollups. Uh, so hopefully we're gonna, we're gonna learn more about it. Uh, there's one company called Cubist, uh, which we actually announced as a bridge bounty recipient uh, earlier this week. Uh, they're building a really cool uh, like programming framework where you can write a contract once and you can deploy it to, to many chains and the click of a button. You can also just deploy it on, on, on it can create a rollup for you, um, um, and like with the click of a button. And uh, so, so they're working with us on the ZK primitives. Um, and uh, I think that's gonna be really interesting. Sweet, uh, follow up question. Did you and Jed plan on matching your uh, cover photos? You're both wearing the same shirt that you're wearing in your cover photos. Well, well Tomer always wears a black shirt, so it's easy to match. This, and is, this is random. <laughs> yeah, well, you also don't have many shirts. I don't have many shirts. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's, 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 <laughs> not, not, not. They're lying. Like, they planned it. <laughs> I forgot. Guys, I forgot. <laughs> Good morning. Um, a simple question as a user side. Um, on the uh, London Metal Exchange um, in March this year, there was an event on the nickel market where they uh, re uh, cancel uh, the whole day of transaction, that's $800 million. Uh, so it's a big legal case now. And um, I'm not personally clear about what's happening with the clawback function in XLM. Is it still there? Who is deciding to use it? And can we get rid of it? Because um, it just doesn't, as an exchange, need to be able to say what happened, happened. Uh, the clawback is still there. Uh, it's, it's, uh, you, you can set whether you want it or not. Like, it's, 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 not, it's not, no, you can't do it arbitrarily. Right. So. Yeah, in fact, when you issue an asset, you have to turn on a flag that says this asset is clawbackable. And uh, when a user decides to hold that asset, so when you hold an asset on, on, on Stellar, you actually have to create a trust line of it, opt in to hold the asset. So when you create that trust line, you know, the user sees that that asset has clawback in it. So they're like, okay, I agree to hold it. I understand that it could be clawed back. The issuer can't change the rules, right? So they have to say up front it's clawbackable. The user goes in with eyes wide open, and assets that don't have that flag can't be clawed back. So it's a very opt-in, eyes wide open uh, situation. Uh, clawback is part of the like the current Stellar operations. Um, it is. We actually uh, so Cerebon has a standard token contract. Uh, which is like a pre-compiled token contract, and it can actually, as we were talking, as Paul was mentioning yesterday, you can actually import export assets uh, from uh, like Stellar Classic or Vanilla or whatever your favorite name it is, uh, and uh, you can move that, so you can move an asset from being on a Classic Stellar Trust Line to a Soroban uh, token balance. Now, when you move an asset from one side to the other, the authority on it, it actually stays the same. So the issuer, the same issuer, the same signers that comprise the issuer actually have control, the same level of control on the Sorbonne, the Sorbonne side. So if you have clawback enabled, the issuer can actually execute an equivalent function call on Sorbonne that does the same thing. I, I realize that we're over time. Um, do we need to stop? We should stop. We kind we kind of need to stop. Okay, one more question. Um, yeah, guys, it was a br uh, brilliant discussion. Um, I've, I've got a question, which is maybe a good last question, which is visualizing what's going to go on in the next ten years. So, if we're sitting here talking to you in ten years' time, um, do you have considerations, or can you share any KPIs thresholds where you um, see Stellar as being merged in almost as one of the protocols that you know? Then there's not many maxis around anymore, but certainly we know there'll be a rationalization of blockchains in the coming decade. So from a road mapping point of view, and if you think about where the TPS gets to, can you share any kind of metrics where you say, hey, we've really solidified our space, ourselves in the space, 
um, for the next, say, 50 years? Are there, do, you, do you talk about that, that or try and visualize what that, look, that, what that looks like? Yeah, I mean, I don't think we like put numbers to it exactly, but I mean, at least in my mind, I would want it to be used, um, sort of become like this kind of de facto payment network that's used like all over the world, right? And, and that will obviously take a lot of TPS and probably not all of it done by the core, so it'll have to be done in like in, in different ways, right? So, um, I mean, it's vague, but you know, 10 years from now is quite long, so. <laughs> Yeah, I think that uh, at the end of the day, what we what we want to have it is we have we want people to use like Stellar without necessarily knowing that they're using Stellar. You know, we want um, you know a significant portion of uh, you know payment volume in the world to um, you know either be on Stellar or be linked to Stellar. And I think access is important too. So that can't just be taking the current inequitable financial system and recreating the payments on different rails. Like the goal would be to do that in a way that actually extends access to people that don't really have access to current financial system. Cheers. Thank you. Thanks.